Assalamu alaikum in this video we are going to discuss enteral and parenteral nutrition this video is a continuation of the previous video in which we did nutritional assessment and nutritional requirements here we are going to do roots for nutritional support we have two roots enteral and parenteral enteral feeding delivers nutrients into the gastrointestinal tract whereas parenteral feeding provides nutrition by means of intravenous route without the use of gastrointestinal tract let's go into the details of enteral nutrition it can be achieved through mouth by normal food or oral supplements such as sip feeding or with a variety of tube feeding techniques which deliver food into the stomach duodenum or jejunum these include conventional nasogastric tubes or rhyles tubes nasoduodenal tubes or nasal jejunal tubes they are used for short term or less than 4 weeks but if nutrition is required for longer than 4 weeks then gastrostomy or jejunostomy are used in gastrostomy the tube is placed through the abdominal wall directly into the stomach and majority of these procedures are performed by percutaneous insertion under endoscopic control using local anesthetic So it is also known as percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy or PEG and the tubes used for these procedures are known as PEG tubes. Whereas in jejunostomy the procedure is similar except the tube is inserted into jejunum instead of stomach. And it is used when gastric feeding is contraindicated or there is a significant risk. Now the enteral route is used when the gut is working normally to absorb food and nutrients and there are no gastrointestinal tract contraindications. It is used in patients who are not expected to be on full oral diet within 7 days post operatively so enteral nutrition is provided through a tube. And in patients who have undergone major surgery enteral nutrition should be initiated early that is within 24 to 48 hours post operatively. There are also certain contraindications to enteral nutrition. It cannot be given when the patient is suffering from intractable vomiting or diarrhea refractory to medical treatments or in case of intestinal obstruction, paralytic ileus which is paralysis of intestinal muscles, peritonitis which is intra-abdominal infection, severe shock because shock causes hemodynamic instability and it can result in intestinal ischemia so there will be decrease in intestinal motility. severe gastrointestinal hemorrhage severe gastrointestinal malabsorption distal high output intestinal fistulas these are abnormal connections between intestine and skin that allows contents of the stomach or intestine to leak through an opening on the skin or when there is inability to gain access to gastrointestinal tract of course and when the need for nutrition is expected for less than 7 days Now we have just finished the roots for enteral nutrition. There is another thing that needs to be considered which is modes of delivery of nutrition. There are two modes, bolus feeding or continuous infusion. In bolus feeding, a syringe is used to deliver formula through a feeding tube and the feedings are given at 50 to 100 ml every 4 hours. This mode is reserved for patients with nasogastric or gastrostomy tubes. and in bolus feeding aspiration is a common complication if precautions are not taken so an important precaution is to elevate the head of bed at 30 to 40 degrees during and for 1 to 2 hours after feeding the second mode is continuous infusion in which the feed is given slowly over a number of hours using a pump that controls the flow rate it is required for nasogejunal nasoduodenal or jejunostomy tubes and the feedings are given at 20 ml per hour and increased in 10 to 20 ml per hour increments every 4 to 6 hours the feeds used for both these modes are polymeric which contains whole protein carbohydrate and fat small molecules which is short peptides and free amino acids and the specific feeds like low sodium diet and liver failure Enteral feeding can cause a number of complications which can be broadly divided into tube related complications and metabolic complications. Tube related complications can be malposition or displacement of tube or blockage of tube. Whereas metabolic complications can be 
hypernatremia, hyponatremia, hyperglycemia, hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, aspiration pneumonia, nausea, vomiting and diarrhea. This was everything about enteral nutrition. Now moving on towards parenteral nutrition. It is indicated when energy and protein needs cannot be met by enteral nutrition in patients with compromised gut function and when the enteral route is contraindicated. It can be either total parenteral nutrition in which all nutritional requirements are provided by the intravenous route or partial parenteral nutrition in which enteric route is also used alongside intravenous route. And depending on which vein is used, it can be either peripheral parenteral nutrition or central parenteral nutrition. Peripheral feeding is appropriate for short term feeding of up to two weeks and excess can be achieved by an 18 gauge intravenous cannula in a peripheral vein. Peripheral nutrition has the advantage that it avoids the complications associated with central venous administration but it has its own disadvantage of thrombophlebitis. Central venous route is required for long term nutrition of more than 10 to 14 days and the catheter is placed in a large vein that goes directly to the heart. This vein can be superior vena cava via the subclavian or internal jugular vein or inferior vena cava via the femoral vein. The complications associated with central venous nutrition are line dislodgement and line sepsis, pneumothorax and central venous or cardiac thrombosis. Now let's see the overall complications of total parenteral nutrition. It can result in nutrient deficiency such as hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, hypophosphatemia, hypomagnesemia and refeeding syndrome in which calcium, phosphorus and magnesium levels are reduced. Overfeeding can also occur resulting in excess glucose, fat and amino acids. Another complication is catheter related sepsis and uh, complications related to line are pneumothorax, damage to adjacent artery, air embolism, thoracic duct damage, cardiac perforation or tamponade, pleural effusion, hydromediastinum and venous occlusion and venous thrombosis due to long term use. This was everything about enteral and parenteral nutrition. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe.